Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this uh, programme today we'll be discussing the legal war against Israel from the United Nations to the to Amnesty International, uh, making up lies and misallegations against Israel and damaging their own credibility on human rights. Warm welcome to the programme and uh, today's guest is all the way from the Netherlands. Uh, he's Andrew Tucker. He's been a, a guest on the Middle East Report over the years. So Andrew, it's great to have you back in our studio and uh, not on Zoom. And uh, like I said, we've done a number of different programmes together on this platform o over the last few years. But do you want to share and remind our viewers how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and how he's given you a, a love for Israel and the Jewish people? Because you've dedicated your professional life to defending Israel. Yeah, thanks Simon, it's so good to be back. And, and to be part of the program. Um, and indeed, it's great to be doing it in person. So I grew up in Australia, Simon, and um, in a Christian family where I was taught that um, the Lord is, is returning. I, I think that was a really key part of my uh, Christian education and the importance of, of uh, understanding the times that we're living in. And I, I grew up fortunately in Melbourne in Australia, which has a very strong Jewish population. And I had many Jewish friends, people around me, um, many from Europe. So there was a kind of a culture of sensitivity, I think, to the, the Jewish people and the history of the Jewish people, which has always fascinated me. Um, and the Lord took me to Europe uh, at a certain point after my legal studies. And um, during my time in Europe, I just became more engaged with, uh, with Christian things. And uh, it was a long process, but at a certain point, I was, became involved in Christian ministry called Christians for Israel International, based in the Netherlands. I became the international director. And I went to Israel for the first time in my life. Um, I knew about the Jewish people and the history, but I didn't know about modern Israel. And just going there uh, and just being in, in Israel uh, blew my mind away and opened up a, a whole new area of reality, really, that there is a connection between the biblical Israel and the future Israel, and that's Israel today. And I think my passion is to uh, help myself and help others understand the realities of Israel today from a biblical perspective, but also from the perspective of uh, politics and, and law. Uh, because often we don't quite make the connection, do we? Uh, we hear a lot about the criticism of Israel um, and we believe that the Lord is restoring the Jewish people. So how does that work? And that's really the work that I'm involved in. That's a big question. That's yeah. a huge question. Yeah. Uh, and Andrew, can you just share also your, your passion for law? Um, because you are an international lawyer and uh, I think you are one of the great defenders of, of Israel on the planet from the Christian community to defend Israel in the court of law, uh, where Israel is now being attacked through a term known as, as lawfare. So uh, where did your interest in law uh, begin and how did you connect law with defending Israel through international law? So I, I studied law at university in, in Australia, in Melbourne. Um, I, I knew sort of fairly on, I was just interested in uh, in, in public policy and government and how to make countries work. Uh, for me, law is about, is, is, is a fascinating profession. Um, I have an academic interest in law. I've always been interested in um, what makes law work, what, when is law working well, and an interest in public international law. So when I went after my studies, um, I went and studied at Oxford, public international law under a famous Australian professor, John Finnis, Catholic professor of uh, international law jurisprudence. 
And I studied with him uh, for a year and I studied also um, other areas of international and European law. And that sort of led me into a career um, involved in, I worked in private practice for many years and became very involved in the energy sector, uh, public infrastructure, um, very international. I traveled a lot through Eastern Europe and uh, Asia, um, working on, on major projects. Um, and then I sort of suddenly, when I started to get involved in Israel, I, I became interested in understanding the position of Israel under international law because everybody condemns Israel, everybody talks about Israel, and they use the terminology of law, which is fascinating in itself that people want to do that, using law as a kind of an immoral uh, paradigm to condemn a particular state. So I've, I've, I've made it my job to try and understand the way this works and, and to research and study the history of Israel from its beginning, but through uh, especially the period after its creation uh, in the United Nations system. And today understanding how these institutions work uh, and what is law and what is not law, because a lot of the time people are talking about law, but they're actually talking about something else. Excellent. Uh, and can you tell us, uh, a few years ago, you announced the uh, Hague Initiative for International Cooperation to, to give Israel a voice uh, and also to fight for Israel on the kind of international legal platform. So can you just uh, break down for us uh, the vision the Lord gave you for this organisation and uh, what you're doing? Because, of course, you're based in The Hague and that's where the International Criminal Court is based in The Hague as well. And also the possibility that we could have uh, the World Court uh, based in The Hague in the near future. Yeah. So it, it was over a period of time that um, being involved in Israel and particularly Jewish Christian relations and realizing that in the public space, um, you know, as Christians, we're very good at praying for Israel and we're very good at, um, I, I suppose, the biblical theological side of things, but we're not always very good in the public defense of Israel. And uh, I, I thought it was important, and, and we thought, there are a number of us, that there should be in Europe particularly, um, th there's, a, there's a vacuum, there's a gap really in Europe uh, and in many parts of the world of a space just to think about what is the modern state of Israel? How did it come into being? Why is it important? What can it contribute? Um, and what is this, this phenomenon of lawfare that we see going on, the use of law to combat Israel? So we set up THINK, we call it the Hague Initiative for International Cooperation, uh, and the I for initiative stands also for Israel. And you'll see it in our logo um, that uh, we want to put Israel the, back at the centre, um, not because Israel is perfect, but because we want to understand Israel instead of just condemning Israel, we wanted to create a space where we could challenge the use of international law to delegitimize Israel, what is happening, and instead to think about why Israel is important, what, it, uh, what makes it tick, and is there another way of looking at Israel from an international law perspective, which we think there is, and we can get into that today, um, because we believe law is being misused to condemn Israel. Uh, the legal system, any legal system, can be used or misused. Uh, and lawfare is not particular to Israel. We see it in many other areas. Um, but it's being effectively used over the last 50 years to undermine Israel as a kind of pariah state that has no legitimacy in, in the area. Uh, whereas Israel is, is probably one of the, the most legitimate states and the most well-functioning states in the world, um, certainly in the region, uh, which makes it a strange thing then that people want to continually criticise it. There must be something else going on. Absolutely. So let's uh, take a look at uh, Andrew's excellent presentation of the organisation that he represents, the Hague Initiative, which is also called Think. <laughs> The Middle East consists of many different national groups, ethnic and religious, 
and the Jewish people are one of them. Their birthplace and the homeland of the Jewish people is the territory that's become known as Palestine. And the longing of the Jewish people to return to that territory is known as Zionism. Now Zionism met with violent opposition from the Arab world from day one. Israel came into existence in 1948 in the midst of conflict. Immediately it was attacked by five of its Arab neighbours. And again in 1967 and 1973, Israel again faced wars of aggression that were intended to wipe it from the map. Nevertheless, it survived. The State of Israel exists. It's not perfect, but it's a democracy. It has well-functioning institutions of government and Christians, Jews, Muslims and others exist side by side and have freedom of religion and, exp and of expression, unlike many other countries in the region. Now the United Nations was established in 1945 to promote and to advance friendly relations between nations. Unfortunately, what we've seen is it become a platform for criticizing Israel and also a platform for imposing solutions on this conflict. There's no other conflict in the world which has attracted so much attention and had so many solutions created for it. THINK is a global network of international law, academics and practitioners and experts from related fields like history, religion and political science who all share a deep concern about the way international law is distorted and used against the State of Israel. And this happens in particular in the United Nations and unfortunately also in the EU. These experts range all over the world, from Australia to America. They contribute to our work on an individual basis. They write blogs and articles, they participate in our research projects and they speak at our seminars and conferences. In addition to these individual contributions, we seek cooperation with other organizations and besides cooperation with universities, we also seek collaboration with Christian Zionist organizations like Christians for Israel and the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. The problem we're tackling is that since 1967, the idea has arisen that the only way of looking at the State of Israel is to see it as an occupying power. We call it the occupation paradigm. And under this way of looking at things, Israel is occupying territory that belongs to the Palestinians who have a right to a state. This means that all Israeli settlements are illegal and it means the Palestinians have a right to return. Now we think that this way of looking at things is, is a blockage to peace. The THINK network is managed by a small core team from The Hague. Uh, since our foundation in 2017, we have seen a growing appreciation of our work and we want to continue and even expand our activities. For the coming years, we have planned three strategic projects besides the daily production of our publications and educational work. These projects are aimed at two key areas. Firstly, knowledge building through educational programs online as well as on-site around the globe. And secondly, a research project that is aimed at the creation of a new legal framework for a new EU policy towards Israel. As our name suggests, the Hague Initiative for International Cooperation, we, with the experts we are working with, believe that this top-down approach of imposing a solution on this conflict is not working. We believe international law allows and indeed requires a different approach whereby states and nations are compelled to work with each other and cooperate and have friendly relations. The top-down imposition of a solution is unfair, it's imbalanced and we think it's unrealistic. Instead, we want to stimulate a new conversation about looking for alternative approaches under international law
in which the nations and the states themselves are incentivized to look for solutions to their own problems. Think is a foundation under Dutch law, but we receive no government funding. In order to finance our operations, we have set up a special program called Friends of Think. Friends of Think, in fact, is a global family of individuals and organizations who commit to support our work on an annual basis with donations varying between 100 and 1,000 euro per annum. And we invite you to become a friend of Think today. We need your help. Join us to develop this work and together to allow Israel to be protected, the Palestinians to receive the dignity that they deserve, and the nations of the Middle East to work together in peace and security. Um, so important to have uh, an organisation that argues Israel's position regarding international law to counter the lies and the bias of the United Nations and the others like um, Amnesty International, other NGOs and also uh, the European Union as they uh, approach Israel and uh, the Palestinian issue. Um, Andrew, as an international lawyer, uh, and this is your area of special speciality, I mean, you, you, you could do or we could do a whole program talking about the legality of a two-state solution, uh, your knowledge and understanding of Israel's history, dating back to the Balfour Declaration, to what we're now celebrating, the 100th anniversary of the implementation of the British Mandate. Um, there is so much that we can learn from that and the League of Nations, but, but why is it that it's the United Nations that helped to create the modern state of Israel with that famous vote in the United Nations. And now that same organization is being used or is, or is being used to uh, carry out so many anti-Israel res, uh, resolutions that, that Israel is singled out more than any other nation around the world, more than South Korea, more than the Islamic Republic of Iran, probably more than Russia at the moment with this invasion of the Ukraine. Um, why is there a systematic bias or hatred directed against the one and only Jewish state of Israel? Uh, it's the big million dollar question, of course. But um, I mean, I think when the United Nations was created at the end of the Second World War, the, the League of Nations system had basically failed. Um, it was set up. Um, it's important just to remember that for a moment, the, the system that was created after the First World War uh, to we, you know, it was a move from empires to statehood. Uh, the, at the end of the First World War, the, the, the world existed primarily of empires, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The British Empire, the Ottoman Empire, uh, and so forth. Of course, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, to Turkey, and the, with the Germans as well. So half the world uh, had to be uh, brought under a new regime, as it were, including half of Europe. And so the mandate system was created, and that was revolutionary. Um, and, and half of the Middle East, or at least a number of the states of the Middle East, were created out of that mandate system. So that was a very important uh, institution, even though the legal nation system as a whole, uh, I think, was ineffective and was replaced by the UN. Nevertheless, that mandate system uh, was effective to create a number of states. So Israel, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, they all came out of that system. Now, the UN, I mean, we need to understand it was born out of the chaos and the destruction of the Second World War. Uh, it was intended to be the system for peace and security in the world. And, and every nation would be part of it and every nation would contribute to it. I think personally that the UN system never really dealt with the horrors of the Shoah. It never really dealt with what happened to the Jewish people. Um, and therefore I think that the UN actually did not create the State of Israel. I don't think it even helped really. There was the partition plan in 1947, but that was more concerned about dividing historic Palestine mandate territory. 
than really supporting the Jewish people. Um, yes, it acknowledged the existence of the Jewish people, their right to statehood, but it was of course rejected uh, in 1947, November, and the territory of Palestine descended into chaos and civil war effectively. And six months later, at the end of the mandate, when the British left, Israel was created. So in my view, the UN did not create Israel. Israel was born and was created despite the UN. And the UN has never done anything of any significance to assist or help the state of Israel. Everything, every war that Israel has fought, it's had to fight pretty much on its own. Um, and I think the UN has shown itself to be ineffective in, in this and in many other areas. Of course, it's very effective in many areas, humanitarian help, uh, there are many areas of the UN that are, are really wonderful, but when it comes to solving complex problems and conflicts, the UN really reaches its uh, limits. And one of the reasons is the one state, one vote system. Every state has a vote um, and an equal vote. So it means that if you can get a bunch of uh, states together uh, on an issue to form a majority, uh, and there are almost 200 states in the world. So you get 100 states together to create a resolution on an issue. You can push an agenda forward, uh, which is what's happened in relation to Israel, this automatic majority for year after year, uh, really, uh, driven by the Islamic world, driven by uh, many in the West and the non-aligned movement to create majorities, to pass resolutions condemning the state of Israel because they don't like its existence. Um, and, and I think at the bottom of it, Simon, is, is some kind of um, resistance to the idea of Jewish sovereignty. We, we simply don't like the idea that the Jewish people now have sovereignty over a piece of territory doesn't fit well within our paradigm of thinking. And I think the church has a lot to answer for as well. Um, uh, both the Catholic church and, and the Protestant churches have failed, I think, to understand the importance and the significance of Israel. Uh, and too many churches are condemning Israel, even today, uh, under international law, um, using international law to justify really what a theological positions, mistaken theological positions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, while you're talking, um, two things spring to mind. F firstly, um, Israel's greatest ever um, foreign minister in Abba Ban, um, and uh, remember reading that he was appointed as Israel's first ambassador to the United Nations because he read a few books on international law and how the United Nations worked, and since no one else knew uh, how the United Nations work. He was given the job as Israel's first ambassador to the United Nations, uh, which is quite incredible. He's the one that helped uh, guide uh, the UN partition plan, uh, proposing that and putting Israel's case forward, spent time with the UN delegates. Um, so we have him to thank for the incredible work he did in those early pioneering years, but also this uh, non-alignment movement yeah. that established. Uh, and I think, did it first really come into its own during the racism is uh, racism is Zionist debate, I think in the mid seventies yeah. um, that the UN adopted that, that combination of Islamic nations combined with those from the uh, Soviet bloc formed one big bloc against Islam and did that when we start to see the hostilities grow a lot more towards Israel? Yeah you had um, I, I think the 1960s actually were critical period 60s into the 70s so you had uh, the Cold War of course so the Soviet world was indeed operating as one as one bloc um, and you had this whole process of decolonization happening so a, a great opposition to the West and these new states coming into existence, you know, in Africa, Asia and elsewhere, and, uh, and, and creating a new identity and of course a place in the UN system. And they, um, they, co they coalesced as it were in this framework of the non-aligned movement um, around the early 1970s particular. And that resulted indeed in 1975 in the you know, uh, Zionism is racism uh, resolution, which really was an expression also of very anti-Semitic uh, 
um, attitude of the developing world towards Israel. But I, th I think many of these new states, you know, of course, they were led along by these larger movements, particularly the Soviets and the Islamic world, because the Arab world was still hostile to Israel. They were still trying to destroy Israel. They didn't recognize Israel. Um, so their policy was to, um, to destroy Israel within the UN system. And I think they effectively used the developing world to, to achieve that. Yeah, it was definitely saw that. It was the case in Africa. Um, Andrew, we often hear the United Nations uh, Security Council resolutions come out against Israel and saying that Israel is uh, breaking international law. And then we see these countless uh, UN resolutions targeting Israel. Now, do they, are they legally binding with international law? Okay, so uh, you have to distinguish the Security Council and the General Assembly. Uh, as a general principle, UN resolutions are more political rather than legal instruments, yeah? yeah. The UN is a political body. It's not, it's not, a, it's not like the parliament. Uh, they don't make law. So UN resolutions are not like pieces of legislation which create law. Uh, of course, they have legal importance. Security Council resolutions can be binding, but every Security Council resolution concerning Israel um, has been uh, passed under Chapter 6, which means it's not binding under the UN Charter. Um, and most of those resolutions have not, they've condemned the unification of Jerusalem, of course, um, and more recently they condemned settlements, remember 2016. But these are really very political statements. They're not binding under international law, nor are General Assembly resolutions, Simon. Uh, especially General Assembly's resolutions. Th these are highly political statements. So if they say, for example, the settlements are illegal, uh, that may be true or it may not be true. It, it all depends. Um, and, um, in that case, the, you know, there is no law that makes settlements as such illegal. It's a much more complicated issue than that. So you have to always look behind UN resolutions and see the, the politics and the di dynamics that are going on behind them. Um, there is a tendency, even within um, the political and legal system, to take resolutions as if they were binding, and I think that's mistaken. Um, it's, it's part of the sort of globalization that we're witnessing, is that we're, we're looking to a source of law, aren't we? We want somebody to make law for us. So we look to the UN as being the source of truth and righteousness and justice, uh, which is, I think, the wrong place to be looking. Absolutely, couldn't agree more with you. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the United Nations um, Human Rights Council and uh, the shocking appointment of a permanent team of legal investigators to investigate Israel? I mean, no other country had they appointed legal investigators to investigate uh, alleged war crimes against Israel and single Israel out more than any other country in the world. I mean, they should be really focusing all their efforts into what's happening in the Ukraine right now with uh, Russia's horrendous acts of aggression against Ukrainian people, including horrific war crimes. Yeah, so this, this is really quite a remarkable development. You're right, the UN Human Rights Council um, does a whole range of things. Uh, much of it's very good. One of the things they do is they create commissions of inquiry or other investigative, investigative uh, institutions to look at particular problem areas in the world conflict areas um, to see where human rights is being violated. Now, that's fair enough, and they do it for many different conflicts. You're absolutely right. This commission of inquiry set up last year is the only permanent commission of inquiry to look at one particular conflict. It came out of the Gaza conflict last year, 2021. You remember it was, again, another of a series of conflicts uh, with Hamas. and. Um, after each of the conflicts, there has tended to be a commission of inquiry to see whether in that particular conflict, last year it was 10 days of, of warfare, whether either side was violating international human rights law or humanitarian law. That's fine. You can do that. But what they've said is, no, we're going to create a permanent commission of inquiry to look not only at what happened last year, but the conflict as a whole, 
and to work out what are the root causes of this conflict. And we'll do that year after year and we'll produce report after report. And the mandate for this commission is so one-sided and the people they have appointed to the commission have demonstrated bias against Israel. They're outspoken anti-Israel uh, people. Uh, Nevo Pillai is the, um, the leader of it. She's from South Africa and she has been, she's on record uh, repeatedly um, for years of, of condemning Israel for being a violator of international law. And of course, Israel violates international law, as, as every country does. That's not the point. The point is when you constantly target one country um, as being a, a violator, not only a violator, but an extreme violator of international law, I think you cross a boundary. And that's what this commission is doing, in my view. Excellent. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent uh, CBN report that's entitled Critics Blast New UN uh, Report Condemning Israel for 11-Day War with Hamas. After last year's 11-Day War, the UN Human Rights Council established a commission to investigate the conflict, although its mandate went much broader. It's unprecedented in terms of uh, scope, in terms of geographic uh, location and most significantly in terms of timing. It's meant to look at the root causes of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict stemming from the war last May, but it's something that can go back to before 1948 when Israel was established and in perpetuity into the future as well. The 18-page report delves into the overall Israeli-Palestinian conflict and concludes by placing the blame on Israel. It states that the findings and recommendations relevant to the underlying root causes were overwhelmingly directed towards Israel, and the report therefore reflects this. It cites Israel's so-called occupation as a major cause, specifically finding the Israeli policy and practices of establishing settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, have no legal validity and constitute a flagrant violation under international law and a major obstacle to peace. Even though Hamas and other terror groups fired more than 4,000 rockets into Israel, the report cites Hamas only three times and Israel 157. There is also no mention of Iran, which funded and armed Hamas during the war. We love Hamas! We love Hamas! At the Geneva UN headquarters, Israeli attorney Nitsana Darshan Leitner led a demonstration against the report. To come and expose the real face of the Human Rights Council of the UN, compare them to not other but terrorists. In the end of the day, both the UN Council and the terror organization have the same goal, to destroy the state of Israel. The UN is using diplomatic means, fake reports, blood libels, and the terror organization using military means, terror attacks and missiles against Israel. Darshan Leitner says the council has 10 agendas, and one is devoted just to Israel. Its commission of inquiry is unique among all other UN bodies, since it's mandated to release an annual report on the Jewish state. Human Rights Council is obsessively going after Israel. This is not the first time. Actually, from their very first day, they have an agenda seven that requires them to discuss Israel in every meeting they have. There are hundreds of countries in the world, half of them, more than half, violates human rights, and yet they have to discuss Israel in each and every hearing they have. So we know that this body is totally anti-Israel. They want to essentially employ what is a form of lawfare, using international law as a political means to delegitimize and attack um, the state of Israel. The International Legal Forum, along with 25 other organizations, released a report singling out the head of the commission. You know, Navi Pillay has already accused Israel of apartheid, of war crimes, of crimes against humanity. And this is the woman that is meant to be adjudicating our supposed guilt or innocence in any Western court of law. Um, if you're a judge, you would never have been appointed in the first place, or you would have to recuse yourself over this kind of impartiality. Mm -hmm. But at the UN, you get rewarded for anti-Semitism and hostility against Israel. 
Great report there by, uh, by CBN and uh, Chris Mitchell exposing the lies and the hypocrisy of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, Angie, there seems to be a kind of repeated uh, behavioural pattern when it comes to the UN and UN agencies when it comes to Israel. And, and the fact is that when Israel is attacked by rockets and missiles by Hamas or Hezbollah and that Israel then uh, responds with, with the IDF by sending troops into Gaza or before into kind of southern Lebanon to take out these rockets and missiles that is actually threatening uh, the Jewish population and the last series of uh, missile wars. Two thirds of Israel's population have been confined to their homes. People can't go to schools, they can't go to, to work, they can't travel, they are stuck in their houses, they've got 15 seconds to get to a bomb shelter. Then you combine this with, with, with the fact as well that these rockets are indiscriminate, they don't target military uh, targets, but they actually target civilian populations. Uh, and yet Israel responds to protect itself, like the first duty of any state is to protect their own people. Then Israel, for defending itself, comes into international com Domination from the UN, Israel's committing war crimes, but they never look at the uh, the truth of what's happening uh, and the and the goals of Hamas and Hezbollah and these Islamic terrorist organisations to wipe Israel off the face of the earth to destroy Israel. They don't look at the fact that they use asymmetrical warfare, hiding behind men and, and uh, women, but when they launch these rockets and missiles, deliberately using men and uh, sorry women and children as human shields. Um, and go against the convention of, of the Geneva Convention on Warfare. So Israel plays by the rules. These terrorist organisations don't, and yet the United Nations condemn the only democracy uh, in the Middle East that's defending its people. Um, it seems like a very twisted world. Mm. It is. It is, Simon. I mean, I think what we need to understand is the bigger picture, um, because what what happens is we we zoom in time and again, don't we, on a particular conflict and we see Israel responding indeed to a particular threat. Israel is involved in a, an asymmetric hybrid war against, basically against Iran, an extreme uh, Islamic radical jihadic uh, thinking. Uh, is, Iran is, is trying to and is successfully extending its influence throughout the region. Hezbollah uh, you've mentioned as well in Lebanon is an enormous threat to Israel on its northern border. Um, it's, it's extending its influence into the Gaza Strip, into the West Bank uh, with its allies. So Israel is not fighting against a few terrorists in the West Bank or in the Gaza Strip. It, this is a, a regional warfare. We're seeing an enormous shift in the Middle East. Um, and we'll come in a moment to talk about the positive side of that shift, I think. Um, but at the same time, there is this, um, this very immediate, uh, imminent threat against Israel. Iran is developing nuclear weapons as we speak. And of course, uh, we're all aware of the negotiations going on in Vienna at the moment with Iran or so-called negotiations to try and slow down their production of nuclear weapons. But it's going to happen. And so Israel know, it knows it only has a small window of time to, to respond. So everything in Israel is doing is in the context of a, of a broader uh, threat to its existence. And, and this is what the UN institutions um, don't want to understand. And bec because of the politics that's behind them, people have taken the position already that they don't uh, like the existence of the state of Israel, and there are many different reasons for for them taking that view. And when it comes on to the uh, the other issue, which I think is also important to discuss, is uh, Amnesty International and uh, their recent publication at the beginning of the year. Now it was uh, published, uh, I think, what's actually called. But before we talk about this, can I give you a quote from the uh, UNHCR Commission of Inquiry before we talk about Amnesty International? It's quite a long quote, so bear with me. It said here, published in Geneva on the 7th of June uh, 2022, the continued occupation by Israel of Palestinian territory and discrimination against Palestinians are not are the are the root are the key root causes of the current tensions. Instability and protraction of conflict in the region, according to the first report by the new United Nations uh, Independent International Commission of Inquiry, 
of the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem and Israel issue today. The Commission also noted that impunity is uh, feeding increased resentment among the Palestinian people. Uh, it identified forced displacements, threat of forced uh, displacements, demol uh, d demolitions, settlement construction and expansion, settler violence and the blockade of Gaza as contributing factors to recurring cycles of violence. So, they don't even uh, uh, identify that the Palestinian Authority is made up of Islamist terrorist organisations such as Hamas, of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, even within, Fat with the, even with the PLO, with the, uh, Fatah and other groups. They don't identify the corruption within the Palestinian Authority or the oppression of human rights by the Palestinian Authority on its own people and just essentially blame Israel's existence for the trouble. Uh, and yet it's, it's the Israelis that built them their schools, their roads, their hospitals and their infrastructure. And without Israel, there'd be nothing. Yeah, I, I think this is, a, the, the problem started really in 1967 when Israel liberated the territories again in defending itself in a war against the Arab aggressor states. So Israel had been created 19 years earlier in 1948 and the borders were never settled. They were never agreed. Um, and the mandate territory that had been intended for the creation of the Jewish homeland uh, was attacked by the Arab world. So the, the root cause of the, of the conflict is the aggression against the existence of the State of Israel. It's not Israel's later occupation of territories because that only came about as a result of the fact that the Arabs had been attacking uh, before, both before and after the creation of the State of Israel. Um, now, this is, a, this is a deliberate ploy, of course, to divert attention from, you know, the whole decades of um, anti-Israel, anti-Jewish aggression from the Arab world. And um, they, they use the occupation to uh, really as a tool to sort of, you know, focus in on Israel for, for oppressing the Palestinians. But there's a direct line from the... Uh, the, the massacre in Hebron in 1929 right through the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem in the 1920s and 30s, uh, the violence against Jews to Islamic terrorism uh, today. So um, this is such a false narrative and it's terribly important. Unfortunately, Europe has gone along with this narrative as well and built its two-state uh, kind of policy based on this idea that if we get rid of the occupation, we'll solve the conflict. It's not going to solve the conflict. The Palestinian Authority is not interested in a state in the West Bank. The PLO is established to destroy the state of Israel. That's in its charter. The charter has never been amended. Um, so international law does not support the idea that Israel must abandon the occupation. Israel has rights, territorial rights, to these territories to this very day. It's only because she's never exercised them fully that there is a discussion about occupation. Israel could and perhaps should have in 1967 applied sovereignty to the West Bank as it did to East Jerusalem. And the Golan Heights, of course, as well. And the Golan Heights, yeah. I suppose the other question as well, I think we need to look into the strategic impact of creating a Palestinian state, knowing that if there were free and fair elections now in the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the PLO would be kicked out, Hamas would take over, uh, and we're talking about an extreme Islamist government on Israel's borders, uh, in which they would use the uh, high plains of Israel, uh, the Judean hills, to launch rockets and missiles at every population centre in Israel. The danger is then you have a, a radicalisation process gets locked into Jordan, could destabilise Jordan and bring down the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan uh, because they would then instigate um, uh, an uprising within Jordan as we saw in 1970. Uh, and before we know it, the situation that Israel now faces is a hundred times worse and worse for the international community as well. Uh, and sometimes they need to take into account the strategic dimensions of saying, yes, we want a Palestinian state, this is the territory, we want it, without even considering the strategic implications for Israel because Israel is a tiny state.
and Israel has to protect herself. Uh, and by doing, enforcing a Palestinian state on Israel, effectively what you are then doing is weakening Israel's borders and uh, potentially you've got a huge genocide on your hands because this is what the situation that Israel faced. But, but talking now about the uh, Amnesty International report that was published on the 1st of February uh, 2022 uh, titled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians' Cruel System of Domination and a Crime Against Humanity. Now, they published this report. It thankfully, received a lot of condemnation for Israel, but it was actually based on lies and mistruths that no one really from Amnesty International visited Israel or the Palestinian Authority during the whole COVID time because there were travel restrictions in place. Uh, and yet these, these academic writers compiling this report for Amnesty International aren't they surely damaging their own organisation's credibility on human rights? If, if they've got it wrong in Israel, what else have they got it wrong? So it seems that this has been, this NGO has been hijacked to carry out a kind of Islamist agenda rather than actually looking at the human rights of the individuals involved. Well, I, I think there's a problem with the, the human rights industry uh, generally. Um, this, this, look, there's a problem. Um, if we, we have to separate the, the so-called occupied territories in the state of Israel. The Amnesty report is focused mainly on the occupied territories, not only. It's also alleging um, or going in the direction of alleging apartheid in the state of Israel itself, which is terribly damaging and, and totally false. Uh, if Israel is anything, it's not, a, not an apartheid state. Arabs are full members of Israeli society, as we know, and so forth, fully involved in government many areas. There are problems. There is an issue of discrimination for sure. Um, but the, the occupied territories is, is a completely different story. Of course there's a difference between the way the Palestinians are treated and Israelis are treated because that's what the Palestinians want. They want to be separate from Israel. The whole point of the Oslo Accords was to create a separation between Israel and the Palestinians. So they have their authority, the Palestinian Authority. They're, they're in the separate areas because that's what was agreed. Um, and to call that an apartheid situation is totally uh, absurd. It misses every historical uh, context. It completely misses the politics um, and the military agenda behind it as well, as you've, as you've pointed out. Um, so in my view, it's a complete misuse of this idea of apartheid as a war crime or a crime against humanity. I think generally what we're seeing is, uh, we've seen it over the last two decades, the Palestinians using the international criminal law system now. Eh? And we see it in the Human Rights Council report as well. The, the focus is on Israel's impunity. What is its impunity? The problem they feel is that Israel is not being prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. So this whole commission of inquiry, they will use the amnesty report and then they will feed it through to the ICC and The Hague and put pressure on the prosecutor to prosecute Israelis for uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now this is, this is not going to solve anything. I mean, in 10 years time they might bring Netanyahu or Benny Gantz or somebody before the court. Is that going to solve the conflict? No. Because they're totally missing the point, uh, the very root of the conflict, which is this, um, uh, this uh, very anti-Semitic uh, desire to destroy the state of Israel. Now, when we talk about the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, aren't we all also talking about something that now is becoming archaic and out of date? Uh, and what I mean by that is the strategic developments that are now taking place in the Middle East with the um, success of the Abraham Accords. The, the fact is that uh, we potentially could see in the near future now uh, Saudi Arabia normalising relations with Israel. Uh, already we see the United Arab Emirates have normalised relations with Israel. Bahrain, uh, Jordan and Egypt are close to Israel. So the whole question of the Arabs being united behind the Palestinian cause. We will only negotiate with Israel when Israel accepts a Palestinian state. Uh, Trump and his administration have completely shattered that illusion, haven't they? So how much do you think that these United Nations bodies, Amnesty International, are completely out of step 
with the trends that are taking place in the Middle East right now? We're seeing a complete transformation, aren't we? A, a, a totally new situation in the Middle East. Uh, you're absolutely right. The Abraham Accords uh, two years ago uh, were really building on a reality that was already taking place. And that is that Israel cooperates at many levels with many countries, despite their political position. Um, and I agree with you, the Abraham Accords were a, a, a really a watershed because they formally recognised, they um, cut that link between normalisation of relationships and the Palestinian conflict. So yes, I agree, I think the Palestinians are being isolated. Uh, they've overplayed their hand. The Arabs are sick of, of the Palestinian problem. They've had a chance of a state many, many times and they keep rejecting it. And I think there's a sense of frustration. Um, they don't want to put any more money into the Palestinians. Uh, and we're also seeing a new uh, reality, and that is um, Israel uh, is becoming a major player, together with Jordan, Egypt now especially, um, in the field of energy, Absolutely. in the field of technology, uh, security, uh, health, transport, so many areas where Israel is playing a very central role. Um, and so the idea of destroying Israel is, is becoming uh, completely unrealistic. And these countries, realising the threat of Iran, are starting to coalesce now, aren't they, around uh, the state of Israel. Absolutely. Um, the other question is as well, uh, you know, you and I have recorded many programmes uh, in the European Parliament uh, uh, and we know about the EU's hostility towards Israel. Now, the fact that Israel could be the solution to uh, Europe's energy woes right now, uh, heavily dependent upon uh, Russian oil and gas and supplying the continent of Europe with, with gas. Does that mean that Europe will have to change its relationship with the Jewish state, primarily because they need Israel. That the Israel also provided global solutions during the pandemic uh, of COVID-19, that Israel is leading the way in, in terms of the 21st century innovation, and that country need, countries and nations need Israel's technology, its, its know-how, its startup nation, for their own economy and their own success. Well, it, Europe's always had a kind of schizophrenic relationship Absolutely. with Israel, haven't they? You know, on the one hand, they do need Israel. They look to Israel, they trade with Israel. Uh, there's investment going in both directions. Um, a lot of cooperation. At the same time, they're condemning Israel time and again for its policies in relation to the Palestinians. Now, that second part is not gonna go away in a hurry. I think it will change over time, but there is a realization now indeed that uh, with the East Mediterranean developing as a, a natural gas hub, uh, there's a lot of gas there which uh, Europe needs um, and uh, we've seen Europe now entering into an agreement with Israel and Egypt there's for the supply of natural gas from Israel through Egypt, uh, LNG in, into Europe. There's potentially an East Med pipeline going to come into, it's, it's a very real possibility that a pipeline will, will be laid. Uh, there's a lot more gas to be found in the area, there's several offshore facilities in Israel. You have Cyprus, uh, Lebanon, uh, there's a lot of gas there and it's going to be an enormous um, supply for Europe because North Sea is, uh, the, the supplies are, are waning. Russian gas is no longer an option. So they, they're going to have to look to the Eastern Mediterranean and Israel. Uh, and Andrew, within, within 30 seconds, how can our viewers who have been fascinated by everything that uh, you've been talking about today and also the great work that you do in defending in Israel in the court of international law, how can they get involved in your organisation and, and learn about the great work you do? So visit our website, www.think.info, sign up for our newsletter, support us. We need, uh, we need a community of people around the world to support us financially. Uh, so please do donate to the work of THINK uh, to enable myself and others to engage in this new conversation about how we can support Israel and help Israel to be what Israel really is and should be, and that is a blessing to the nations.
Excellent. Andrew, thank you so much for being my guest on the Middle East Report. Great to see you back in our studio. Thank you. And I want to thank you for watching uh, this programme at home. I think it's so important that we have the arguments, that we know how to defend Israel in the uh, court of international opinion, uh, which is international law, that uh, when uh, the media or when politicians condemn Israel for breaking international law or against UN resolutions, then we need to understand what they're saying so we can confront those arguments and those lies. And if you want to know more about Israel, find out for yourself, because that's the, the best way that you can stand up and fight for Israel. Now, we're called to be ambassadors uh, for Israel and the Jewish people, so we need to stand up for them. We need to know our facts, and the best way we can do that is to understand the legal challenges that Israel faces in the international arena that is the United Nations and NGOs. So I want to thank you for watching this week's Middle East Report.